Hello and welcome to Rural Doctors. I'm Jerry Gannon. In this broadcast, we're going to take a look at telehealth. But before we begin, here's a quick word from Rural Health West CEO, Belinda Bailey. Hi everyone, and welcome to the first Rural Doctors broadcast for 2013. Um, as usual, we've got a great lineup of topics for the broadcast this year, and I'd really encourage you to jump onto the Rural Health West website and keep an, an eye on what's coming up because there's some fabulous programs, and I'm sure lots of them will be of interest to you. This broadcast is of particular interest to Rural Health West because we're absolutely passionate about telehealth, and we really believe that the future of health service delivery for rural and remote Western Australia will rely more and more on telehealth services. And whether that's high quality, high definition video consultations, or whether it's store and forward technology, we really believe that this makes a huge difference to patients in the country. The analysis of the research and the anecdotal feedback we've had from patients is that they love telehealth, they love good quality video consultations, because it means they don't have to travel. And when you're sick and you don't have to travel, then surely that's a fantastic thing. So we're really enthusiastic about um, supporting telehealth in Western Australia. And if you have any questions or any queries about establishing telehealth and video consults or store and forward technologies, please call Rural Health West and speak to one of the team here, because that's what we're here to do. The other thing I wanted to remind you about is we have a fantastic lineup of conferences coming up this year and our first one will be the annual conference on the 23rd, 24th of March. The theme this year is uh, children of all ages, very much focusing on a paediatric theme but with some fantastic speakers, international, national and local. So we'd love to see you down here for that conference and as you know the annual conference is so much more than just a CPD event. It's all about gathering 200 rural doctors together who can network, share their stories, share their experiences, bring their families, get to know other people. So we'd love to see you down here in March. Thanks, Belinda. Now let's get started. On our panel for this program, Dr. Mike Civil, a Kalamunda GP, and Mary Potofsky, Rural Health West Telehealth Support Coordinator. They join Olga Ward to discuss the basics of telehealth and how you can use it in your practice. Well, Mike and Mary, thanks for coming along and welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us, Mike, where are we at with telehealth? Well, it's a difficult one. I mean, in general practice, we've had the opportunity over the last uh, year and a half to actually get to grips with using telehealth in practices in an outer metro area. Um, rural and remote practices have probably been using telehealth for a little bit longer, certainly for some specialists areas, but in general practice it's a relatively new area. Unfortunately some of the changes to the MBS item numbers mean that uh, outer metro practices uh, will no longer be eligible from January the 1st, but it's still going to be very important for rural and remote practices to really get to grips with this sort of technology. Mm -hmm. And what sort of advances, ad advances are you seeing Mary? Well there's a lot of people um, investigating different sorts of software and um, and hardware to, to actually do the telehealth um, consultations with their specialists. And there's also lots of people looking at um, what other applications there are for telehealth. Right at the moment, we're um, restricted by the MBS items for specialists to GP consultations, mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, there's a lot of people out there looking at what else they can apply the telehealth consultation to. Yeah, I must admit I've been looking at things like um, nurse practitioner GP, mm -hmm. which to me seems logical mm -hmm. if you've got a more remote nurse practitioner with Absolutely. whom you're sharing, uh, sharing practice stuff. Yep. And in our, in our big state that's a huge thing. Yeah, and mine paramedics, I yep. would guess, for local GP or RFDS. Yep. Yeah. But telehealth has already been used uh, by the RFDS, for instance, where they have telephone communication with patients, where they help manage patients, give advice over a telephone line. The other obvious uh, one would be email communication with the patient, where um, there's, uh, for instance, an INR result that the patient uh, might want to clarify treatment and so they have a communication by email. So telehealth can really encompass email communication, any sort of electronic communication 
and obviously that's including in phone lines, potentially even social networking, although there's obviously uh, areas of problem with that with security Consultation issues. by Facebook, perhaps not, not, really. not so advisable. Mary, you were talking about store and send. Yep, store and forward. Yeah, I mean, as Mike said, um, telehealth can encompass a range of different information and communication technologies. Um, store and forward is where you um, take a photograph um, or an, it could be an x-ray depending if you've got the software to read it, but mm -hmm. any, sort, any form of picture that's actually emailed securely through is considered store and forward. So that's another thing where they might be looking at either a retinal mm -hmm. photo or a photo of a wound or um, a skin condition. Mm -hmm. So they get the nice close-up beforehand and yep. then they chat through the management yep. with the support person and the, and the patient yep. and at they, the time on the video consult or the telephone or whatever. Yep. And that's the sort of thing that they would use in um, scenarios where they've got a better, say, digital camera, a digital SLR or a digital Instamatic, um, as opposed to the camera that they have for video consultations. Yep. And uh, I know certainly the plastics department at Royal Perth mm. do this rather a lot with their wound management. Yep. So who is going to benefit most, do you think, from telehealth and who are the really suitable patients for engaging? Well, obviously those in a remote and rural location, primarily for the convenience. Uh, if you haven't got to travel hundreds of kilometres to see your specialist, there's a huge advantage straight away. So those patients that would have taken a day or two days or even three days just to be able to see their specialist, they're obviously going to get a huge benefit from being able to use telehealth technology. Not all clinical scenarios uh, will be suitable for telehealth, but it's quite surprising how many are in fact suitable. And certainly the follow-up of patients where it's being able to discuss with a specialist how the patient's going, how the management's working, whether there have been any problems, are very amenable to a telehealth scenario. Yeah. So what sort of things are being used at the moment? Well, there's um, a lot of ophthalmology happening, um, especially with um, clients up in the Kimberley and ophthalmologists and the Lions Institute. Um, there's also lots of rheumatology happening. Um, plastics in the um, public health system is using telehealth quite a lot and has clinics with um, their surgeons and patients out in the rural and remote areas. So this is for surgical follow-up yep. that you're talking about? With the ophthalmology, um, a little more difficult in a general practice setting, what kind of imaging are people sending backwards and forwards? A lot of people are using um, their iPhones in, in the first instance to take the photos of um, the eyes and then um, emailing them securely to the ophthalmologist and then having the follow-up consultation with that. Yeah. I know in the North West they were doing a lot of retinal photography and then um, follow-up clinics for the patients who'd had the retinal photography, but I guess that's very specialised equipment. Is that um, translating itself well into the telehealth scenario? It seems to be. Um, certainly um, the Lions Institute is keen on progressing that um, particular um, service. So, yeah. And um, we have local optometrists here in Kalamunda who are very happy to take images uh, of the fundus yep. and then uh, email them to us. So even the optometrists on a high street, now admittedly some of the more remote and rural locations may not have that technology, but it's clearly uh, becoming more commonplace for even high street optometrists to be able to take an image and transfer that electronically to a GP, and obviously there's no reason why they couldn't transfer it to a specialist in Perth. So, um, in terms of the logistics of doing something like that, say if you're looking at an X-ray or a retinal photograph, that would be emailed in advance or you'd be looking at a printout while you're talking on the screen, what, what sort of has to happen beforehand and during? I mean, you could do either, basically, either scenario. Um, you could, as the clinical support person for the patient in the remote setting, you could have the x-ray or the retinal image uh, with you uh, with, when you're with the patient, and you could describe the, the findings on the x-ray, or you could go through the report um, with the specialist while you're having the video consult. But equally, you could do a store and forward. So you've, you've got your image, whether that image is a retinal image or an x-ray image, and the image could have been transferred electronically for the specialist to have on their desktop to then discuss where they want to go with the management of the patient. Yeah. There's also a number of um, uh, software packages that actually let you share desktops as well. So 
you can actually have the image on your desktop and share your desktop with the specialist so they can see the same image, mm -hmm. image at the same time. And can that be used on really commonly available stuff like Skype or does that have to have a special link? That tends to be on um, paid sort of software, but again some of that software isn't exceptionally expensive. It's something like GoToMeeting would be $50 a month and only one party needs to actually pay that fee. So there is other options out there. There's a number of um, different software packages that do have that capability. And Skype itself does have that capability in its paid option. I think the stumbling block is not going to be the technology. The technology is very much ahead of what we're doing, I think, clinically. Um, I think the, the big issue is really for GPs and doctors in remote and rural settings to feel comfortable with what they're doing and to actually get to grips with using the technology and having a go more than anything else. Yeah, and finding out, I guess, mm. what it's useful for. Are there any things that it's really not useful for or where you would say, oh gosh, don't use telehealth for that? Well, certainly uh, examinations, um, certainly some body system examinations obviously wouldn't be amenable to a telehealth environment. So um, any sort of examination where it was crucial that the information that you obtained from doing the clinical examination was going to make a big impact on the management of the patient. If that information is absolutely vital, then you need to think whether a face-to-face -face would really be much better and in the patient's interests mm -hmm. in that scenario. But we've, you've mentioned already the follow-up of surgical cases, the follow-up of surgical wounds, where the specialist is already familiar with what work they've done for the patient, and it's really a review process. So it, it's really where a clinical examination is a vital component of the consultation. Um, but there's many scenarios when it's yeah. not so vital. What about if you say, I mean, the obvious thing is talking to a dermatologist about a patient with cystic acne who just needs a Roaccutane prescription and you can transmit their cholesterol results and have the, you know, acne-fied patient sitting on the screen for the dermatologist to look at. Yeah. Um, and that to me would be kind of clear and easy image to transmit. But what about if you were looking at something that you weren't sure was a melanoma? Yeah, look, my feeling would be that you'd really want to be sure you had specialised equipment to do those sorts of images where you want that level of resolution. But I'm sure that uh, dermatoscopes, um, particularly dermatoscopes that are, can be attached to a camera, could yeah. record a magnified image. And that would be, my feeling would be, that would be more suited to a store and forward environment mm -hmm. rather than for a, a live environment, if you like, where you're using a high definition camera. Because even though it's a high definition camera, there's probably too many variables for such a crucial diagnosis. Yeah. But again, that's, it's really going to boil down to the clinician at the time deciding whether they feel comfortable with what they're seeing. And I guess, could you take a macro photograph and send that on? I guess some of that would Decent. be determined by the specialist. There is many um, digital cameras out there that have the capability to take really good photos. And as mm. Mike said, the store and forward option is probably best in that, in that scenario. Mike, you were talking about clinical support person. Mm. That's the GP? Uh, it doesn't have to be the GP. The, when the MBS item numbers were introduced, the scenario they particularly covered was the patient was with a clinical support person at the local setting. So that might be a GP in a doctor's surgery. It could be a practice nurse uh, in a doctor's surgery. Or it could be another clinician, basically. It doesn't even have to be the patient's own GP. It could be another doctor, for instance. Uh, at the same surgery and the consultation was then occurring with a distant specialist. But the, the description was very clear. The, the patient was with a clinical support person and they were having a consultation with a distant specialist. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept um, around clinical support raises a whole number of issues because basically suddenly you've got two clinicians involved with the, with the consultation. You've got the specialist obviously distantly and you've got your local GP or nurse. So there are certain responsibilities, for instance, as to who might be taking on the next part of the management of the patient. And that sort of thing needs to be clearly outlined and defined within the video consultation. So everyone's aware of who's responsible for the next investigation, for instance, or review of the patient, and, and who will carry out that process. So it's, it sounds to me like it's a bit fiddly and time consuming. 
It can be, but there's also benefits to that sort of thing. Um, a lot of GPs have stated um, they find those consultations with the specialist quite informative and a form of mentoring and professional development where they're learning um, a lot from the consultation themselves as well and the management mm -hmm. of so, such conditions where they may not have to refer on in future. Yep. Um, there's also benefits in terms of the continuity of care. So once you do iron out the, the things that Mike's talking about in terms of responsibilities, you've actually got a really good um, continuum of care. So the patients really appreciate the fact that they've got their GP. Their, their GP who they've known for many years often, they may never have seen the specialist or they've only seen the specialist on one other occasion. Mm -hmm. And they feel very comfortable having a familiar face supporting them, being their advocate basically. Yep. And if they're not sure or they don't understand uh, what the specialist is getting at or what the specialist means uh, by a certain phrase they use, they can ask their GP straight away. And because they're familiar with their GP, they feel comfortable to do that. Uh, and that, so you're basically clearing a whole area of misunderstanding instantly. You know, and the yep. patient can get a lot more out of the consultation because they've yep. got that support person there. And we found that um, a number of Aboriginal medical services have said this is one of the um, most important scenarios for them, is actually having an Aboriginal health worker or another support person for the Aboriginal person with the specialist. Um, exactly for the reason that Mike said, that the interaction with the specialist is, is much more comfortable and much more open when there is someone that the um, Aboriginal patient mm -hmm. is comfortable with. Somebody who can translate it into their own context yeah. and their own Basically. session. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of time, it does sound to me to be quite time consuming. Is it sufficiently well remunerated for people to, to want to take it up? It is certainly. I think the incentives that the government have provided certainly give us the opportunity to uh, have a go with this sort of technology. It's not going to replace the face-to-face, -face, the gold standard, if you like, will always be face-to-face. -face. But it's a great addition to what we normally do. The, the fact that there's two clinicians effectively involved with the care of the patient at that time means that there is a little bit more organisation involved and certainly at our practice we found that it's more time effective to actually run a surgery of video consultations. So basically we know that the equipment is in the consulting room, we know that the connection is working and set up, someone's made sure the connection with the specialist is, is ready and ready to go and then we've done a series of a block, if you like, of video consultations through a morning surgery. Mm -hmm. And that level of organisation, that's new to the practice and that does take a little bit of getting used to. Um, but once you've got your head around that, you've got your head around the systems that you require to ensure that coordination, mm -hmm. it's really no different from a face-to-face. -face. And, that, and that is the, the fundamental philosophy we're after. We're trying to do what we would normally do in a face-to-face the only difference is that we're doing it remotely. Yeah. And that sort of scenario where there's a clinic is something that specialists are also looking at in terms of setting up specific blocks of time that um, GPs and patients can actually access that specialist um, on that day during that time for video consultation. So there's still a lot of groundwork to do in terms of those work processes and flows, mm -hmm. but everybody I think is um, just trying to find what works best for their practice. Yeah. Now this is telehealth through the general practice with the GP present. Are there any other forms of, say, video consultations going on in country areas that GPs might need to be aware of? There are certainly some um, GPs who are GP obstetricians who are doing some of their um, antenatal visits via teleconferencing, mm -hmm. um, but they're also using the nurse at the other end. Um, there's also some um, video consultations to aged care facilities. There's also a Medicare a benefit schedule itemed for that as well, mm -hmm. um, again with specialists, but there are some GPs who are wanting to use that um, mm -hmm. for their own practice as well, not remunerated in the same way, but um, it's still something that they find is, is obviously cost effective for them. Are there any places where the patient can kind of attend their specialist consult without having a support person? It's not, not currently. Um, I mean, I would like to think that this is the start um, of, of how GPs use telehealth and video consultations and I would like to see that it expanded along that very line. Um, younger patients are very familiar with uh, using computers, iPhones, social networking and what have you. They're very comfortable with using this technology and it'd be nice to think that eventually um, down the track that a doctor consulting with a patient alone 
um, would be something that would be a, a regular service that GPs could offer. But I think the, the next stepping stone, I think, which is what you've touched on, is, is the, the aged care facilities, certainly, where even in an outer metro location where a GP finds it difficult to find the time to visit patients in a, in a nursing home setting, the, the nursing home could have a relatively straightforward and simple technologically wise uh, setup. They could, the GP could then act as basically the remote specialist. They could then uh, video consult into the nursing home. The patient in the nursing home could be supported by a, a nurse, for instance, at the nursing home. And that would mean there'd be a lot more contact with patients down there their GP in a nursing home setting. So there's a lot of scope for where this could go mm -hmm. and, and really the, the bottom line is how well the uptake will be from the profession and how comfortable people feel with it. And we'll return to that discussion in a moment. Dr. Mike Civil and Dr. Angus Turner speak with us now about why they use telehealth and how it's beneficial to their patients. We found telehealth has been very helpful for our practice. I really think that those patients that have any sort of difficulty with moving, uh, with getting into the city, with traveling, so disabled patients, certainly elderly patients, have really got a lot to gain from telehealth. Younger patients are a little bit more mobile, obviously. They're uh, a lot more comfortable with public transport, with driving into the city. They, uh, they can still gain a lot from it, from the convenience side of things. Professionals who don't really want to spend half a day going in to have a 10 minute consultation with a specialist, obviously that sort of level of convenience is going to be appealing to them as well. Saving the patient the travel time and the expense and the difficulties and the logistics, especially older patients or patients that have trouble with mobility and access, getting patients all the way to an urban centre, which can be scary and a barrier for that person. But telehealth provides an opportunity to possibly avoid that whole transfer process by being able to start management and follow up and plan for the care without having to travel all that distance and with all that expense. Now, Simon, just take a seat. Um, this is Dr Angus Turner, who will be your specialist today. We're going to have the conversation through the through the computer system. Angus, this is Simon. Simon's just coming in for a review of the eye irritation that he's had for the last few weeks. And uh, we just wanted your input and help with his care. Hey, I'm uh, Angus Turner, as you heard. And I'm an ophthalmologist away at the Lions Eye Institute. So um, I'm just checking first that you can actually hear me all right. It's a little bit unusual for some of our patients and as I say an elderly patient is a little bit more uncomfortable with the process. So what we've done is we've used some of the RACGP templates and we've printed off information sheets for our patients. What we do is we get the patient to come to the consultation 10 or 15 minutes earlier than normal so that we can give them some information, introduce the idea that they are having a video consultation but we're really reminding them that they're having a video consultation, give them some idea of what they can expect from the consultation, and just point out that obviously they're going to be talking to a specialist basically through a TV screen. And so we give them a little bit of a workup. And the other thing we've done is that we've asked for feedback, just a few simple questions after the consultation, just to gauge how comfortable they were with the consult and whether they would be happy to do the same sort of thing again. It's been uh, particularly useful for our elderly patients, which came as quite a surprise. I've always expected younger patients, teenagers, people who use iPhones and social networking, to never have a problem with telehealth. But it's been a real surprise that our elderly patients have been really grateful and appreciated the fact that we can offer them a telehealth consult. It means they don't have to go to the city. Now, we're only half an hour from the city, but a lot of our elderly patients don't have the confidence to drive into the city. They have to rely on friends or relatives, and they've really appreciated the fact that they can just come to the surgery they know well, and they can have their consultation with a specialist, and even more, more so, they can have us with them in the consult. So if there's something the specialist says that they don't understand, we can explain it for them. If there's something the specialist feels they'd like to know about the patient's past, we can look up their records and we can give the specialist more information about that patient. So our elderly patients have felt very comfortable with the process and they've really appreciated 
the ease and the convenience of having telehealth at the surgery. All right. Well, thanks for agreeing to uh, trying a video consultation over the internet. Um, it's not quite the same as seeing you face to face because I can't look at your eye in detail, but I've had lots of good information um, from your GP. And so um, it's a suitable consultation to have. Is, are you happy to continue chatting on the internet? Absolutely, yeah. Well, benefits from my perspective in telehealth as a specialist uh, is mainly in the continuity of care that can be provided for a, a regional area in between the actual physical outreach trips. It's still, in my opinion, very important to have the specialist outreach trips to the area because about a quarter of the consultations that we see on telehealth require follow-up or a review in person at that next visit. But the visits are sometimes infrequent. Some areas are four times a year or even twice a year. And having that connection to the community and telehealth opportunities means we can start something and a month later have a follow-up with telehealth or have telehealth first, begin some management and follow up at the visit in a month or two. Um, and Dr. Sybil told me that you've had your eyes being irritated for a couple of months. Can you tell me more about your story? Yeah, to my right eye, it's, um, it, it might have even been before that. It's, you know how things kind of start to creep up on you a bit and you kind of dismiss it, but then I realised it just never quite felt the same as my other eye. A lot of conditions are amenable to telehealth. Uh, we found it particularly useful with the osteoporosis screening because we can discuss the nature of the exercise that a patient has, the type of diet they have. A physical examination is less of a priority, but even a physical examination with a high definition camera that we've got with the, the setup means that we can still uh, enable the patient to show the specialist joints, uh, getting them to literally put their hand up close to the camera, can show the specialist joints. We've had patients uh, stand up and alter the, their pos posture in front of the camera so that the specialist can see whether there's a certain curvature of the spine. So some, some simple examinations are certainly amenable to telehealth. Occasionally, um, the specialist has asked myself as the clinical support person uh, for the patient to examine the patient and then relay the findings that I've had. But it's not been a huge issue at this stage. Diabetic patients who uh, have got quite complicated diabetes where we're looking for advice and guidance with changes to management, to drug therapy, we can discuss all these things. So the range of patients can be quite large. Okay, have you tried any different treatments? What's, what have you put in your eye so far? Just um, the basic eye drops and... Okay. I guess um, we did, um, i just have a quick look at his records. Um, we did try some drops uh, a few weeks ago, just some simple antibiotic drops. It looked like he might have had the early stages of a pterygium, uh, but it didn't seem to make a great deal of difference, did it? No, it didn't. In terms of finding a specialist, that you can actually have a consultation with. Um, there are a number of different registers that are being developed. Uh, Rural Health West will keep a record of people that are using telehealth in terms of specialist referrals. Other sources such as uh, ACRAM and the Royal uh, College of GPs as well have reference bases. And there are also a number of private companies that have sprung up um, to be able to be an intermediary and help you find the right specialist. Um, I've found so far that it's often been uh, a relationship that you already have with a referrer and that tends to work the best because you already have a system in place for referring and in fact you know that specialist and that specialist ideally provides outreach in, within your area so that there's a clear referral pathway and follow-up plan. When we arrange for the telehealth consult basically we're referring the patient to a specialist as normal and in that referral letter we will have included certain aspects of the past medical history and relevant investigations. It's just that the consultation with the specialist instead of being face to face is telehealth. So they've got the same information they would normally have in a referral but the big advantage is while I'm with the patient having their consult with the specialist, if the specialist says 
can you tell me a little bit more about the past medical history? Firstly, I'm there. If I can remember it, I can give it to the specialist. Or I can look it up on our, our own computer system here at the practice, and I can give the specialist up-to-date information relating to history, but also relating to investigations. So the specialist can request investigations to be done before the video consult, or more normally what they can do is at the time of the video consult they can ask me to arrange a number of tests, I can arrange them, and when we can then do a review consultation perhaps a month after that initial one. As much as you can when you're outside, and we'll have a follow-up chat in a month and get a photograph of your eye um, with, a, with a phone, and that way um, if it's extending or still irritating, we'll discuss surgery, removing it with surgery. Well, maintaining the equipment and uh, the setup, um, there can be technical difficulties to that. Uh, so if you have fancy equipment, um, say a slit lamp um, in your emergency department with a hookup for a camera, there are plenty of opportunities, I guess, for technical issues. And some people can't stand thinking about technical things. And so um, if the mouse is not working because the battery's flat, that's a major technical barrier. Um, but other people are quite um, happy to try and cope with those things. So we've actually found that the cases where it's the simplest um, have worked the best. And the kind of technology that is simple and works well is the stuff we use every day, which is Skype, for example, as a means of communicating um, for video conference because people use it uh, all the time. And something like a smartphone, say an iPhone, for example, has a very good camera in it. And um, these are used every day, so people are quite familiar, if they own one, of how they work. Um, there are issues about storing the images and how we send the um, patient record. And personally, I'm using a record that is um, called MMX, and it's um, got a web-based uh, patient record, which is secure, and it means I can access it wherever I am in the state or um, even interstate or overseas. And that record is where I, I store the images and keep the referrals and keep the medical records so that it's all in a secure place and doesn't pass through um, or get lost on normal email channels. There's a lubricant called Refresh Liquid Gel and you can pop that in four times a day. The use of the, the video consultation has been very interesting for us as the patient's GP. The, the MBS item numbers uh, make provision for the fact that the clinical support person can actually be a practice nurse. But as this was a new manner of carrying out a consultation, we really wanted to see how it was for us from our perspective as GPs. And a lot of the GPs at the practice have found that being able to discuss the patient with the specialist and see how the specialist dug a little bit deeper for the particular medical problem has been quite educational for us. So I've got a better understanding now of the sorts of relevant questions to ask my patients for conditions um, that I would be less comfortable with. And the other key area, of course, is the type of investigations that are appropriate. So it's been actually a bit of an educational tool for us and we can pick up a few snippets of how specialists manage these patients, which has been great. And as I say, the, the specialists being able to uh, see the patients in our practice rather than the patient having to go into the city, that level of convenience is fantastic. And then we'll um, follow up with another appointment. Um, if surgery is required, we'll get you all the way in with a view to discussing the surgery and operating on the same day so that you only have one trip out yeah. to the city. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, and we want to try and avoid surgery, so using the... Surgery. We've recently checked what sort of telehealth we're actually doing, and the last 100 patients that we saw, um, basically most of the people were actually optometrists because they've got a lot of imaging equipment for eyes, and they're particularly good on eyes. Um, so if you're stuck with a patient, sometimes it's worth discussing the problem in a telehealth consultation, and if certain measurements are required, there may be an optometrist close by who we have a relationship with because um, there's often only one in each town in the regional areas. Um, so we'd refer to that person for extra information. The other 25% or so, so far, has been from doctors working in hospitals, in emergency departments. So for example, in the Kimberley or the Pilbara, um, patients come through the emergency department and need 
a, a telehealth consult, and only 5% so far have actually been with GPs um, in their private practice. And that's probably because people are scared of the, the barriers to having a, a consult, what sort of imaging is required or what sort of information. But it has worked successfully for the 5% that we've, we've done. There are still things that we're going to need to learn and improve. And so when it comes to ophthalmology and the eyes, I think optometrists are very happy to try telehealth with eyes, and so are hospital doctors. Um, but when it comes to private practice GPs who are often very busy in their community already, the, the barriers to eyes seem to be higher or larger. And I think more education and contact with the GPs will enable them to realise that it's not actually as difficult and has good potential. That's great, Angus. Thanks very much. We'll oh, see you in about a month. Any other questions? No, that's good. Thank you. Uh, all the best. There we go. That's great. So if you just follow that advice, yeah. I'll write the name of those drops down for you and just find a little scrap of paper. But otherwise, yeah, just as I say, the sunnies are the really, really important thing and the refresh was the name of those drops. And we'll see you again in a month. Okay. There we go now. Thanks very much. Okay. See you next time. And our thanks to Dr. Civil and Dr. Turner. Now let's return to our panel discussion with Mike Civil, Mary Potofsky and Dr. Olga Ward. Okay, well now we've had a, a good look at, uh, at the consultation, could we just ask about some nuts and bolts? And I guess foremost in some GPs' minds, given that, that this is going to be a fairly significant setup cost, is uh, MBS item numbers and what exactly they pay for. and what other grants are available? Um, Medicare's actually got um, not only the MBS items, but they've also got some financial incentives. So the financial incentives have been offered um, over three years. Um, they run out at the end of um, the nine, 2014 financial year. Um, this financial year, the um, incentive is 4800 and in two instalments. So you get the first instalment after the first telehealth consultation and that's 1600 mm -hmm. and then you get um, the rest of it after you've done 10 consultations. Yeah. Next financial year that whole incentive reduces so it's a good idea to get in as soon as you can. Yep. So Mike, in terms of the equipment and software upgrades and server upgrades and things that you might need sure. for this what kind of cost outlay is a general practice looking at? I mean obviously that's going to vary a lot but it doesn't have to be uh, an excessive outlay. Uh, a standard desktop computer system would certainly give you enough computer power if you like so that that would be a seven or eight hundred dollar box. Um, a relatively small on current home standards a high definition TV screen so our TV screen would probably be about 21, 22 inches I don't know in the new money, but in the old money it would be that. Um, we've got a, a very uh, standard, again, hi-fi system for a computer system to use for our sound. We use a wireless setup, so a wireless dongle, if you like, from Harvey Norman or somewhere like that. Um, a high-definition camera, again, you're not having to go to professional level cameras to get an idea of whether this is right for you and how you practice, mm -hmm. but a reasonably good high definition camera, again, from any of the street outlets, basically. And finally, the way we've done it in our setup is to put it all together in a, a movable cabinet within our practice. And so the whole of that, that setup- That looks remarkably like a Bunnings portable tool cabinet to me. the one, it looks very familiar. <laughs> and it certainly met all of our needs. And, and basically, I think we could redo that cabinet again for certainly two, two and a half thousand dollars. Um, so you're not looking at a huge outlay. Um, one thing that I would encourage uh, a practice to consider spending a little bit more money on would be a decent wireless router. I think it's really beneficial to have the, the facility, the unit if you like, as being movable around the practice. And so we've certainly found having it wireless based is really good. Mm -hmm. But a wireless router and a decent quality wireless router is probably money well spent. But if you're in a multi-doctor practice, absolutely. I guess if you're in a solo practice or a two-doctor practice, you can just dedicate one room, yeah? Absolutely. And, and you've got to remember, these incentive payments that the government have offered us to basically have a go with telehealth, they apply to per practitioner. It's not to per practice. So if you're in a group practice, um, it's actually quite a generous incentive 
to have a go with this sort of technology and as I say, see whether it fits with how you work with your patients. That sounds really good. Mike, again, you're in the city and you can actually stroll around to Harvey Norman. Is there somewhere that GPs could access something like a standard equipment list that would be useful so that they could order stuff over the internet from their usual computer supply? Yeah, there's a number of um, different organisations. Rural, Rural Health West has some options listed on their website. Um, the Australian College of Rural and Re Remote Medicine also has a list of items. It really does depend on how the practice wants to utilise telehealth, whether they want to have a mobile unit, whether they want to use their desktop, an iPad, whatever. Um, so they're the sort of options that they need to consider is how they're going to use telehealth, what's the best scenario mm -hmm. for them. And that really leads on to then what the equipment um, they will or will not need. Yeah. Um, but in the first instance, as Mark sort of alluded to, is, is your connection. That's the first thing is, mm -hmm. do you actually have the um, appropriate connection to do anything? Yeah. Um, and what impact is doing a video consultation going to have on the rest of your practice um, if you do use some of that um, you know, internet right, plan so that you've you're got. using most of your wits for doing the telehealth, yep. then the whole of medical director or whatever it is it that you're using might that. just slow down or crash. Yep, on the Rural Health West website we've actually got um, a, I guess a, a flow chart or a process that actually outlines step by step what you need to do to actually become telehealth enabled. And one of the first things that we suggest is test your internet speed and make sure that you've got enough bandwidth to mm -hmm. actually do a telehealth consultation. Yep. And you can do that very simply. Yep, um, on the internet. Yep. Speed test. What speed would you suggest? I mean, obviously faster the better, but... Yep, and it, um, uh, they suggest that uh, 512 kilobytes per second upload speed is required for a um, video consultation. So you need to look at then what other um, needs your mm. practice has. Yeah, and Mike, when you've done these consultations, yeah. do you find that there is any video lag or no, um, I mean, anything in your... Admittedly, we're, um, we're in an outer metro setting. Yep and possibly our uh, internet connections are better than some, but we've actually found no problems uh, with, with the quality of the transmission. Um, the video link uh, is, has been perfect, it's been fine, and certainly audio quality uh, is, is very clear. Uh, we have found, because we use a wireless setup, that certain locations within the practice building are, are not quite as good as other locations, and that's usually dependent on the distance from the router, and that's the sort of We've learnt that from our experience and, and to my mind that's one of the crucial things. This is an opportunity to get to grips with this approach to how we practice yep. and um, you know there may be issues for certain practices but again it's not a huge outlay to have a go with this technology really. Yeah. And Mike, I noticed that you're using Skype mm. and I know that most or many of my colleagues do use Skype um, and that there are huge uh, concerns about security issues and security of patient information, which I think the doctors worry about considerably more than the patients in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you kind of de-identify the sort of information sure. that might go in through the consultation? Well, the, the first thing to say is obviously the consultation is happening between um, a location that's your general practice and with a specialist at a distant location. So the, the phone numbers, if you like, the Skype numbers, the Skype contact details, are basically your own practice and the distant so specialist. Public domain numbers in any case. Absolutely, and certainly numbers that it, both of us as doctors would be quite happy for us to be, pub, you know, quite happy to be publicly known. So there's no uh, patient uh, identifiable numbers, if you like, that are gonna be recorded on a Skype address book. Mm -hmm. um, because they're coming to your surgery and they're talking to a distant specialist. So the only thing then becomes the actual content of the consultation. So it's those few minutes that you're actually having the consultation with the specialist. We felt that um, for someone to actually potentially hack into that conversation um, and basically listen to a medical conversation, the risks are, are relatively small and the type of information being transferred uh, is going to be meaningless to, to an outside observer. So we, we felt comfortable that uh, from a security and privacy viewpoint um, mm -hmm. that it wasn't a huge issue. So if somebody were trawling, the, say they were trawling the Skype network looking for information, what sort of information are, are the hackers actually looking for? Well, I mean, my, my feeling would be that um, 
the key information that uh, hackers might be interested in uh, would be identities, uh, which is enough information to perform identity theft. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that I have considered things is I would, I would consider that uh, the potential for identity theft, if you like, within a video consultation is very small because there's not a huge amount of crucial information that's being transferred during the video consult. And then you've got to ask yourself is how well protected is my practice network and clinical information on our standard desktop software mm -hmm. system. I mean, if, uh, hopefully you've got the same, you know, you've got rigorous security issues to prevent identity theft in that scenario. At the end of the day, that to my mind is, is the key concern is could the patient's identity potentially be stolen? And I just personally don't think there's enough information being transferred within a video consult to, to enable that to happen. Yeah. There are some guidelines on the internet, um, both with the Royal College, Royal Australian College of General Practitioners on the use of Skype and how to um, make the consultation as secure as possible. But the, the issue of security is the same um, Really, if a hacker wanted to hack into a number of different types of mm -hmm. video, consult, video consultation um, software, they could. It's just a matter of um, Skype's just frequently used, I think. Yeah. In terms of keeping a record of that consultation, how does that happen? I take it you're not, you don't record the video oh, of the not, consultation? No, no there's um, definitely the, the RACGP's default position, if you like, is that you don't record video consultations and, and certainly it should be something that um, is made clear to the patients as well that uh, generally speaking we don't record consultations. Uh, the scenario where a, um, a patient, for instance, with a, a neurological problem that has a, uh, a slight um, alteration in gait, uh, the way they walk, uh, or an unusual tremor, um, there may be a scenario then where it might be useful to have a short video segment so that you could show the distance specialist mm -hmm. and it might be reasonable then to, to record that piece of information. Um, but if you were recording that piece of information, uh, it should be considered no different for any other information that you write, might write in the patient's notes. The only difference is that rather having a written word, you're having an it's item got an of information, image. it's an image that you're, you're attaching. Mm -hmm. So um, if you are store, um, recording and storing uh, an image or a series of images, a video clip, then you need to put the same sort of security levels on that information as you yeah. would with a normal patient file. And who keeps the record of the consult? Like uh, who, t who types up, I take it you type up notes afterwards? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So basically what we would do as the GP, as the clinical support person, I would record in the patient's record that this was a video consultation and, and I would notify who was present at that consultation so that I was the support person would automatically be done by my clinical software. The um, patient's name obviously is recorded because we've got their patient file open and who the specialist was that we were having the video consultation with. So I would make a consultation note no different to what I would do in a normal consultation. And the specialist would also be making a record in their own system. And we would expect a, uh, a letter back from the specialist anyway, because mm -hmm. it's still a consultation between the patient and the specialist. I'm just there as a clinical support person. So we should still re receive a letter. And that, that will, um, again, support the information that was carried over in the video consult. If there was particular things that the specialist wanted me to do on, uh, on behalf of their clinical management, arrange some tests, um, then I would notify that in the record anyway and give the patient the necessary investigations. So it's just recording good clinical notes as always, basically. Yep, and just making sure that you make that note that it is a video consultation yeah. as opposed to face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Same way you do when you've got a telephone call, it just exactly. pops up as telephone call yeah. yep. on OzCodes. Do any of you, either of you have any um, issues that you think would really be worthwhile raising at this point? Things that you think, gosh, you know, if I were starting out in this, I really wish I'd known about that? My feeling is that it's a useful adjunct, it's a useful addition to what we do in general practice uh, in a variety of different settings. Um, I think it's, it's a very useful thing for our patients and I think the the technology and uh, the, the concept, if you like, might be a little bit 
scary and unfamiliar for some GPs, but I would encourage GPs to, to have a go. They may not feel that it's appropriate for their particular practice and the way they, they want to practice as a GP, but it's a relatively small investment, in my opinion, um, and the potential gains for both patient and doctor are really huge, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, and I guess I would suggest that um, looking at the sort of clientele that they actually have and where, where would be the best place to start and using a speciality that they refer to often um, is a good way to go. Um, and also, just as I said, have a go. Um, actually um, utilise it as you would any other um, specialty or any other sort of service. Just do it in the comfort of your own practice. Mm. There's a lot of resources available at uh, Rural Health West at uh, the Australian College of Remote and Rural Medicine and the RACGP and there's a lot of resources that can help the process, if you like, uh, be demystified, if you like. Now when using any new technology, there can be problems as you get started. Mary Potofsky is Rural Health West's telehealth support coordinator and she takes us through the basics of setting up a video conference as well as things to consider and how to deal with common technical issues. There's three major steps involved in setting up telehealth. The first thing you need to do is consider your internet. Do you have enough speed? Is there a lot of traffic on your internet connection? And do you have the quota or the plan to actually allow you to do video conferencing? You can find all the details about how to check your internet speed, what sort of speed you'll need, and whether the quota um, you've got in your organisation is enough by checking the fact sheets on our website. The next thing you need to decide is whether you're going to use a software package for video conferencing or whether you're going to use a service provider. And the more common option that people are using at the moment is using free, free software or paid software. Software that allows you to video conference with either one party or multiple parties. And again, on our website we have a list of some of those options. With either of those options, obviously, you'll need equipment. There's a number of things you need to consider when choosing your equipment, and I'll go through those in a moment. But your basic equipment involves a computer to actually process the information, a display, computer screen or TV screen of high definition, a camera, either a fixed camera, such as the one we're using here today, or a small portable camera from the actual laptop that you're using or one that attaches via USB. You'll also need a microphone and speaker. Sometimes you can get speakers that are quite good in, built in your computer. Other times you can buy um, high definition speakers or microphones. The one that we have here is a microphone and speaker unit put together. This unit um, can be purchased obviously from Polycom, but there are a number of other providers. Again, our telehealth fact sheet on how to become telehealth enabled is on our website, along with all the other fact sheets you can find on how to set up your room, the considerations that you need to make um, when deciding on your equipment. There's also some fact sheets on paid software and free software. All of those there, ready for you to download at your convenience. So let's have a look at what a real video conference looks like. I've got Alex on the other side of the line and we're going to have a look at what it's like to do a real, real video conference. Hi Alex. Hi Mary. Now Alex has set himself up in a way that I've asked him to show you that sometimes video conferences aren't set up the best way they possibly could be. The lighting in a room is very important when doing video conferencing and is one of the reasons we ask people to actually have a test run of their equipment and their setup before they actually do the video conference. Alex has got the blinds open at the back. In doing so, he's exposed the camera to a lot of light. Unfortunately, the light isn't on his face, so we can't see him. Alex, can you close the blinds behind you? Yes, Mary. In closing the blinds, what Alex is effectively doing is focusing the light upon his face. The other important thing to consider is where the camera is. Alex, will you move the camera so it's face on, please? By doing this, I'll be able to look directly at Alex as if I'm actually talking to him face to face. Other things to consider is how far away the camera is. Alex has set his up, so we've got most of him in the picture. If there were two people there, you need to consider putting the camera at an angle that enables both people to be in the picture. The position of your microphone and your camera are both, uh, microphone and speakers are also important. 
if the speakers are too close to your microphone, there might be some feedback. So that'll be one of the things you need to consider. Another way to avoid that would be to try and use your mute button. So when I'm talking to Alex, he actually has his mute button on, so his microphone doesn't pick up what I'm saying through the speakers, and vice versa. This unit that I showed you earlier actually has a mute button on it. Other units, such as the one that Alex is using, actually has a mute button on the computer. The other thing that might happen is that um, people on the other side might be shuffling papers or doing typing or tapping pens, etc., on the table. It's important to make sure that the mute button is off when, when you're not talking, so any of those distractions don't distract the person talking. Alex, can you give us an example of what it's like when somebody doesn't have the mute button on? As you can hear, it could be quite distracting and quite loud. And if you've got any problems with your microphone or there's more than um, two people on the video conference, it can be difficult to hear what's happening. The other thing to consider before you start your video conference, and preferably in the information that you give your patients and um, staff doing video conferences, is to think a little bit about the clothing that you're wearing. Now Alex has got a nice dark shirt that contrasts well against the background. If he had a shirt that was the same colour as the background, it may be a little bit more difficult to see, in particular if there's more than one person on the screen. The other thing to consider is stripy or very complex patterns on clothing. It makes it harder for the uh, data to be transferred via the internet. So nice plain colours, bright or dark depending on the background of the room that you're using, is something worth considering. As well as the interruptions that might occur from the people in the room, there's other interruptions that might happen from outside. For example, it's really important to make sure that your mobile phone or phone is turned off or on, off or down, as well as your patients. So that's another thing you can consider telling your patients. You could also use a door sign that shows that there's actually a teleconference on inside the room that you're in and that it's important to be quiet. This is a door hanger that you can just pop onto your room. It's available from a number of different places or you can just put meeting in progress, please be quiet. So hopefully your video conference will be trouble free, but there is sometimes problems with sound, picture or your connection. The most important thing to do is to make sure that you've tested before you actually do your clinical consultation. Make sure that all your, thing, all your plugs and all your cords are connected as they should be. Your microphone, your camera, your speakers, etc. If your picture's distorted or it breaks up, all the same happens with the sound. It could be your um, connection. Again, you need to check to see if you're plugged in correctly. What also may be happening if it's breaking up is that somebody else in your practice may be using the internet um, to download a large file or upload a large file. This will have an effect on the traffic that's going through your internet lines. So making sure that you schedule your video conferences when this sort of traffic isn't regularly happening in your practice is important. You may also have things open on your computer. Applications such as iTunes or things with photos take a lot of data. So making sure that all applications are closed and perhaps only leaving open in your video conferencing software will help with the connection that you've got. For more troubleshooting tips and tricks, visit our website and there'll be links there to other websites that could also help you. Telehealth is of great benefit to both our patients and to our professionals. It does have a few things that you need to consider and work out how it's going to work best in your practice. But once you've done this, it's actually really quite easy and provides a great service for those patients who live outside the metro area and really need to get to those specialists. I hope that you can start your service soon and that we can assist you on the way. Mary, it sounds like, although there might be some, um, some problems setting up, that common sense will overcome most of the difficulties and mm -hmm. that there's some help at hand. Yeah, I, I really think that um, there's enough people out there who've done it to learn from. Um, there's enough support and resources out there, you just need to access them, who can really step you through all the things you need to know about your connection, your equipment um, and your work processes and then it's a matter of just giving it a go. Fabulous. Well, Mike, on that note, do you have any final comments? Sure. Look, I mean, as we've said, it's a new process. Uh, I think you'd find that a lot of patients and some, some patients in surprising categories such as elderly patients who will really appreciate the fact that they've been able to use a video consultation rather than have to travel a long distance to see their specialist. So I would encourage everyone to have a go. It's, it's not just for those 
Ethernet and techno savvy patients, it's for all of your patients. It can really make a difference to their care. And that's all the time we have on this program. Thanks to all our guests, Dr. Mike Civil, Dr. Angus Turner, Mary Potovsky, and of course, Olga Ward for their time. We're back on the 5th of March to look at some methods for motivating behavioral change. I'm Jerry Gannon, thanks for joining us.